Welcome to The Blitz, a podcast from Coram Deo Church. The Blitz is all about tackling tough topics head on at full speed. Are you ready? Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever time of the day you happen to be listening to this episode of The Blitz. My name is John, lead pastor of Corndale Church, and I will be your host today. I say that as if there's a bunch of different hosts to this podcast. There isn't yet. Maybe we'll work on that. But today, you're stuck with me. And uh, our topic, what we're going to be talking about is cowards in the pulpit, confusion in the pews. This is something that's been percolating uh, a little bit with me. Uh, it was sparked, at least in part, by uh, a conversation that Pastor Rustin and I had on a recent episode of B-Sides. If you haven't listened to the B-Sides podcast, I encourage you to do so. Rustin and I talk about theology and all the kind of tidbits and things that you just don't have time uh, to get into on a Sunday morning sermon. It's kind of the stuff that didn't make the final cut, but that's interesting and important anyway. So if you haven't checked out B-Sides, I encourage you to do so. It's a lot of fun. Um, but a conversation Pastor Rustin and I had in one of those episodes, we were looking at Revelation 21. We were talking about actually uh, eternal judgment and the issue of hell. And as we were reading that, there was something that just stuck out to me that I thought was really uh, uh, relevant. And actually, it popped up in my Old Testament reading this morning. So we're just going to go there for a little bit. Okay, so let me read Revelation 21, verse 8. It says this, But as for the cowardly... The faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. So this verse is talking about not the first death, but after Christ returns, there will be a resurrection from the dead. Uh, all people will be resurrected, and those who uh, believe, who are faithful, will be resurrected unto eternal life, and those who uh, rejected Christ and his gospel and his kingdom will be resurrected into uh, the second death, the lake that burns with fire and sulfur. But as John the Apostle is recording this here, um, it's so interesting. The first thing, the first characteristic, the first sin that he identifies that will mark those who are excluded from the kingdom of God is the cowardly. And then he says the faithless. And then he goes on to list other categories, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters. And I think that um, we we may be um, used to uh, language of murderers and judgment, um, sexually immoral. We're going to get to that in just a moment. But John says the cowardly. The cowardly and uh, the faithless. And so you need to understand, um, cowardice is something that is incredibly offensive to God. And it is generally offensive to God, but it is especially offensive to God when it is his people. Uh, those who, who know him or claim to know him who exhibit this lack of courage so I want you to hear, okay, I want you to hear what God says in Malachi. This is what I was reading this morning. It just stood out to me. In Malachi chapter 2, uh, verses 7 and 8, and then again, uh, we'll look at verse 17. It says this, For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of Ho. So, so far, so good. We go, yeah, absolutely. The priest who is the mediator who speaks uh, on behalf of God, who represents God to the people, uh, he should speak truthfully. He should speak honestly because people are listening and they're seeking instruction from his mouth. Okay, so for the lips of a priest should guard knowledge and people should seek instruction from his lips. He is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. That's verse seven. Then verse eight. But you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. So here is God's rebuke to the priests who are the teachers and the instructors of his people. You have turned aside. And by turning aside, you've caused people to stumble. 
cowards in the pulpit, confusion in the pews. Then verse 17, you have wearied the Lord with your words. But you say, how have we wearied him? By saying, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord and he delights in them. All right, guys, this is very clear, and this is punchy stuff right here. God, uh, through Malachi, is rebuking the teachers of his people, right, who should guard knowledge, who should be uh, instructing God's people in truth and in God's standards, but rather they are causing people to stumble And here is the fundamental problem. God says it. They are saying, these instructors, these these priests, these pastors and preachers, if you will, they're saying everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord and he delights in them. What is that? That is a failure to call sin, sin, right? It's just that simple. It's a failure to call sin, sin. God's instructors, his priests. For us, that would be our the preachers and teachers that God uh, equips and blesses the church with. They have failed. They have failed to call sin, sin. And not only do they not call sin, sin, but sin is actually being celebrated uh, by those who God has called to call sin out, right? And there is a, there's a massive warning. There is a massive judgment in this. This is very similar to what happens in Romans chapter one, where um, God is is rebuking uh, the whole world, but especially uh, his people. Because, because of what? Because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. All of humanity has done that. And they approve of evil. And here's the thing. There is a judgment against evil. Uh, those who call evil good and those who be out of cowardice refuse to call sin, sin. This is why James 3.1 gives all teachers, preachers, pastors, elders this warning. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. This is, this is why... The charge of Malachi is so important when teachers who are trusted teachers, right? Right. God's people trust pastors. They trust teachers to give them instruction. When those teachers fail to teach truthfully and faithfully and clearly, right? People follow. People follow it. And the sin and the cowardice of the pastor or the teacher is multiplied in the congregation and throughout the church. So James warns us, not many of you should become teachers because we know that teachers will be judged with uh, greater strictness. So cowardice, especially when it's coming from a leader in the church, is not something that God tolerates. And it's not something that the church should tolerate at all, right? There's no room for cowardice in the pulpit. But here's the thing. We're in this moment. We've been in this moment and we can say, hey, it's been brewing for a long time. It's been percolating for a long time, whatever. However long it took us to get here or, you know, it doesn't matter. We're here. Okay. And here's the thing. Cowardice is being revealed in the pulpits right now, right now. And over the last year, and I think this is actually part of the, um, the gift of the difficulties the church has been uh, in over the last year. It has been clarifying. It has been uh, in many ways purifying. But right now, what's happening is cowardice in the pulpits uh, is being exposed. And one of the primary ways it's being exposed is in the in the um, area of sexual immorality. Now, one of the reasons we have to talk about this is because sexual immorality has become not only culturally accepted, but culturally celebrated, mandated, and to the point where if you say anything that would question uh, the ongoing, as Al Mohler would say, sexual moral revolution, if you even question that, right? You are a hater, you are bigoted, you are a racist, you are on the wrong side of history, there's no room for you, 
Uh, it, it's just insane right now. And so that, that pressure and that kind of cultural climate is, is creating tension and it's creating pressure for pastors, pressure like, like, like many pastors in, in our day and age have never had to experience. And so the issue of sexual, sexual immorality, LGBTQ, all of that stuff, plus all the other letters, it is all revealing at exposing the character of preachers and teachers, and some are being revealed as faithful, courageous leaders, and others are being exposed as cowards. So let me let me just maybe answer the question: how how would you know? What would that look like? And I think a, a good kind of simple rule of thumb is is to say uh, to say it this way: pastors. Pastors should speak as clearly and as forcefully as the scriptures speak, right? Um, we should say what the scriptures say. And where the scriptures speak, pastors and preachers should speak. And where the scriptures are silent, pastors and preachers should be silent, okay? Now, this issue, again, is coming up front and center with the issue of sexual immorality. Let me... Um, just read from you what the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Keep in mind that this was to be read in a church service. So this is the kind of forthrightness. This is the kind of clarity and courage and conviction that should be expected in our churches. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 9 through 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of of our God. So just to clarify, the question is not, can God save, can Christ save, forgive, and cleanse uh, people who were, who had given themselves over completely and fully uh, to sexual immorality? Can Jesus cleanse them, forgive them, and make them new? The answer to that is absolutely yes. The apostle Paul says, and such were some of you. The church is a community of people who have been saved by Christ, cleansed, sanctified, made new, given new hearts and new minds, a heart of flesh uh, that that wants to do that which is good and pleasing to God. There's no question as to whether or not God can save them. Of course, he can. The issue is not can God save them. The issue is this. Do people need to repent of those sins? Is homosexuality something that needs to be repented of? Is is transgenderism, is the LGBTQ ideology and identity, is that something that needs to be repented of? And the answer to that is yes. Yes, it needs to be repented of. Can it be forgiven? Absolutely. It doesn't matter how much of a mess you've made of your life in any category, and that includes sexuality. It doesn't matter how much of a mess you've made of yourself. When you come to Christ, he cleanses you and he makes you a new person and he transforms you. He changes you. But the question is this, does sexual sin need to be repented of or is sexual sin something that should be embraced and accepted and something that needs to be really avoided as a topic uh, of discussion or something that is preached that's coming from the pulpit? And the answer to that is absolutely not. This moment requires pastors to courageously call people to repentance in Christ, to repent of their sin, to prevent, to repent of all of their sins, and that includes repenting of the sin of sexual immorality. Listen again to Paul's words. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, 
idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality. And he goes on. Paul is no coward. Paul speaks clearly. There's there's no confusion as to what Paul is saying here. And as pastors, right? Pastors, uh, our job is not complicated. That's not to say it's easy, right? But it's not complicated. We need to say what God has said in his word. We need to speak as clearly with as much force and with much emphasis and conviction as God speaks to us in his word. And God has not been silent about the issue of sexual immorality. God has not been silent about the issue of sexual immorality. And God cares deeply. Remember the words of Malachi, For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. Cowards in the pulpits leads to confusion in the pews. Now, I want to just just briefly, as we end uh, this episode, I want to speculate as to why this is going on and why it happens to be so prevalent. And I and I think that there are a number of contributing factors that that um, that contribute to this really this this epidemic of cowards in pulpits. But I'm going to speak to one issue that I think it maybe is easy to overlook. And I think um, maybe more prevalent than most of us think. And, and here's what it is. And this is going to sound terrible, but oh, well, you've made it this far. You can make it in a couple more minutes. I think that many pastors, many leaders in their hearts, in their minds, in the way that they think, and in relation to what they aspire to, they have traded in the local church for a movement. Okay, they've traded in the local church for a movement and consequently they value fruitfulness as they define it over faithfulness. Okay, so there's a trade from the local church to a movement and you hear this all the time. It's a movement. It's a movement. No, we we have a church. We're the church. We are the bride of Christ. We are a community of people that Jesus promised would be hated in this world and would would face tribulation. Okay, so when you get away from the church, which has, you know, we have historical traditional definitions that help us understand what is the church, right? You know, uh, the, our reformers did a, a, a really a great job of just distilling this down to some really basic fundamental things that there is the, the true proper teaching of God's word. There is the administration of the sacraments, that is communion and baptism. And there is, there's church discipline, right? Those are uh, three fundamental marks of the true church, the right and true teaching of God's word, the administration of the sacraments, uh, communion and baptism, and and then some of it uh, added to that church discipline. Now, here's what's so interesting, right? Here's what's so interesting is that you can look at churches in communities and in, in, in our country and go, you know, the word's not being taught there. Uh, you might have selective texts that are being taught, but the word is not being exposited. Y- you have TED Talks, you have the word being used, you know, in a way that is just foreign to its intention. Uh, if it's even opened at all, you'll notice that there is a diminishing amount of time being allocated to the preaching of the word uh, in churches. There's lots of time for music. There's not a whole lot of time for preaching, okay? That's a sign that the church has been exchanged for a movement. Another issue is the the sacraments, communion. Is communion being served? And is it faithfully? Is the fence, is it is the table being fenced? Is there a distinction being made between those who believe and those who do not believe? Is there such a thing as church membership? Church membership means that local elders are on the hook and responsible for their flock. Hebrews says that that the leaders will give account uh, for the souls of the people that they are over. You can't do that in any sort of, you know, 
real way without a form of church membership. And then without church membership, there can be no church discipline. All right, so so these are the things you want to look at at a church and go, churches are marked by this. Church membership, you belong. Um, the tr- right and true preaching of God's word. God's word is a priority. There is uh, the the rightful administration of the sacraments. And there is such a thing as church discipline. If you're at a church that doesn't practice church discipline, you're in trouble, right? You are in trouble because what the elders and leaders are telling you is that when you throw your life headlong into sin, they're going to be fine with it. They're not going to get involved. They're not going to do anything. Right? So so pastors and leaders have traded the church for a movement. They're no longer content with a local flock, a flock that may be smaller. And so what goes along with that trade is a value system it, it, from, uh, from faithfulness to what God has called us to do to fruitfulness, right? And this always, this will come up. If you talk with um, people from churches like this or pastors from churches that have kind of gone down this road, the argument will be, but God is using it, right? So many people are coming, but here's the thing. God cares about faithfulness. God cares deeply about faithfulness. God, we, we can't uh, uh, adopt some pragmatic uh, view of the church. And that doesn't mean that we should neglect um, being practical or pragmatic at all. But there's a, there's a sense in which um, pastors who, are, uh, who have traded in the church for a movement and care about f- uh, fruitfulness, that being what I mean by that is numbers of people coming versus faithfulness to the word. Um, because that value system has, has transitioned and taken place, now we have pastors who don't want to say certain things, who don't want to call out specific sins, who don't want to say clearly what the scriptures say clearly because they know and they fear. If they say what the apostle Paul said, people will leave. And rather than being faithful to the scriptures, these pastors would rather have their rooms full of people. Now, here is the sad irony to this issue, okay? When a church abandons the word of God, and this always happens from the top down, it's from the leaders, the preachers, the elders, when they lose uh, their confidence in the word of God, the whole church loses its confidence. So when the church abandons the word of God, they are prone to find themselves abandoned by God, the word. Let me say that again. When a church abandons the word of God, they will soon find themselves abandoned by God, the word. Okay, let me read to you from Revelation chapter two. Some of you know in the opening chapters, you have a uh, Jesus speaking to some local churches and, and he has some encouragement for some and then he has warning and rebuke for others. In chapter two, this is the church in Pergamum, chapter two, verses 14 through 16, it says this, but I have a few things against you. Now, this is not Jesus speaking to the world. This is Jesus speaking to the church. I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. So here's the issue. There are false teachers in the church that are being tolerated. Now, here's what God says in response. Therefore, repent. Therefore, repent. And and he goes further. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. All right. So here's Jesus' call to, to pastors who have sold out the scriptures, who are afraid to say clearly what the scriptures say, who have traded the church for a movement and care about numbers more than faithfulness. This is what he says. Repent. Repent of your cowardice. And then there's the warning. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Friends, we indeed find ourselves in just confusing, difficult um, times. And what's happening around us culturally is insane. And it's happening at light speed. But here is what cannot happen. We need courageous preachers and pastors 
who just say what the word says, who care more about offending God than they care about offending the people who come. And when you have a coward in the pulpit, you have confusion in the pews. But when you have clarity in the pulpit, right? When you have clarity in the pulpit, you have people who are instructed, you have people who delight in the Lord, you have people who love God and love their neighbors. When you have clarity in the pulpit, you get conviction in the pews. Guys, this is such an important thing right now. So that's all I'm going to say about it this morning. I want to thank you for um, joining me this uh, this morning on the episode of The Blitz. And uh, look forward to being with you next time. Until then, take care. <laughs>